In this video, reproductive specialists discuss the latest research on sperm motility and sperm motility restriction in the context of male contraception, as well as the vaccines that affect germ cells. The study of a sufficiently large number of news has shown that scientists around the world are concerned about the topic of sperm motility. Moreover, it worries them not only in terms of increase in motility, but also motility restrictions, that is, in the context of male contraception. Two groups of researchers from North Carolina and Osaka University investigated how sperm can be manipulated to limit its motility. As we know, the female oral contraceptive has a very large number of side effects, and therefore many women avoid taking them or tend to avoid them. Also, there are quite invasive methods of male contraception, such as vasectomy. In fact, this method is quite common in the United States of America, where many men who already gave birth to two or more children believe that it doesn't make sense to continue this function. And they do a vasectomy, the intersection of the spermatic cords. Moreover, by the way, a fairly large percentage of men later decide to have a reverse operation. And this is quite problematic. Firstly, it's quite expensive, ten times more expensive than a vasectomy. Secondly, its effectiveness is doubtful. There is only 27% chance that this function will recover and they will, they will be sperm in men's salmon. It all depends on the time that has passed since the vasectomy. The scientists from North Carolina suggest using antibodies to block sperm motility. And it was quite a successful study for them. Here they used antibodies. Scientists from Osaka University in Japan conducted a serious study and found a molecule by blocking which they obtained infertile mice. So they could completely block their sperm motility. By molecule, do you mean some kind of protein that is responsible for sperm motility? Yes, it's a protein that, according to the data, migrates to the middle part of the spermatozoon, that is, to the middle part of the tail of the spermatozoon. It's a protein that provides interaction with calmodulin, that provides the motility of the tail. And therefore, the motility of sperm can be blocked. So, if we continue further research and develop some pharmacological drug, we can find less invasive approaches to male contraception and help both women and men plan their future lives. I wanted to ask, in the body we have so many different types of cells with flagella, for example, lung cells, ciliated epithelium. So, are we talking here about a different principle of functioning, different proteins, or are we talking about topical application of this drug? So far, there have been no clinical studies. Did the mice survive? Yes, they did. During the experiment, only the spermatozoa were affected. Was this process reversible? Yes, it was. These are short-acting drugs. There was another interesting study that was conducted at the Monash University in Australia. Here, on the contrary, they could accelerate spermatozoa using high-frequency ultrasonic radiation, by means of which they affected human spermatozoa. If you remember, in one of our previous issues, one specialist talked about special baths 
where they also used high-frequency ultrasonic radiation. The scrotum is placed there, and the scrotum is treated with high-frequency ultrasonic radiation that affects the spermatozoa, which is in the state of concussion for a while. So the opportunity for fertilization for conception is reduced. What I read was a rather short article in which the specific frequency of ultrasound wasn't indicated. They examined bovine salmon and human salmon, and they claimed that the increase in sperm motility was about 30%. Did they process sperm in a test tube? Yes, they did. And then they looked at it under a microscope to see how much this motility was increased. <laughs> now they say they want to conduct clinical studies and use this method specifically for the infertility treatment associated with sperm motility disorder. I have a question. Why exactly is this happening, this type of disorder, infertility connected with a sperm motility disorder? Maybe the problem was related to the increased viscosity of the sperm, and with the help of ultrasound it was liquefied, because for me it seems a bit weird. I really don't understand how we can use this data clinically, because if we talk about assisted reproductive technologies, we cannot process the eggs with ultrasound. Yes, we can't, but we can treat sperm with ultrasound and do classic IVF, which, as you know, is a little more physiological. In fact, scientists say there is nothing physiological in the IVF process. The fertilization process in the laboratory was completely described. And it's completely different from what actually happens in the fallopian tube. There is no such environment at all. There are no special proteins, special reactions that occur in the fallopian tube that regulate this process. Of course, using IVF, we manage to deceive nature. But still, it's nowhere near the process of natural conception. By the way, talking about spermatozoa, in fact, there is a developed drug that was already used on volunteers. As you know, many people are afraid that vaccines have a direct effect on germ cells, and they are not far from the truth. Because the idea that we use a vaccine to control birth over a large area is really captivating. But as you know, these vaccines, such vaccines were not originally developed for humans. They were developed for the purpose of rodent control. That is, if you spray a certain drug or distribute a modified virus that blocks sperm motility, you can remove entire families of mice. Because these creatures have a short reproductive cycle and they will all die out within two, two years. They simply won't leave any offspring, so you can get rid of them over a large area. But we have to be very cautious. It's a double-edged sword. If we use this uncontrollably in some biosystems, we can simply deprive predators of the natural food and greatly shift the balance in the biosystem. So, someone else will definitely take the place of the mice. As far as humans are concerned, it's very tempting to similarly make a vaccine that would make a person infertile for a while. In this case, the experiment is carried out on a man, not a woman, for one simple reason that men's germ cells are constantly produced, so the chance of establishing fertility spontaneously is much higher for men than for women. So women do not use such drugs. They use only hormonal contraception, which suppresses the very process of ovulation. And the drugs for men can really reduce the sperm motility to zero. Or they can add the protein that 
produces antibodies that cause a loss of sperm motility after ejaculation into seminal fluid. Such vaccines exist. They were tested by volunteers. On average, the duration of the action of such a vaccine is up to 12 months. Then a normal sperm motility and the ability to conceive were spontaneously restored. That was conducted on volunteers in African countries. The results of the study were published in good scientific journals, naturally adhering to the ethical committee. There were small groups of volunteers from 80 to 200 people maximum used. Talking about anti-COVID vaccine, then many people were afraid that after the anti-COVID vaccination they, they could become infertile and these people, non-vaccinators, those who love to manipulate scientific facts, among other things, they use the data of that study. But in fact, here we talk about the vaccine of different kind, because anti-COVID vaccine is a vector vaccine, but uh, a vaccine suppressing fertility is of absolutely different nature. I came across another interesting news about the achievements in the field of male fertility, although the study has so far been performed on animals. They could get immature germ cells, rounded spermatids, in rhythmous macaques. The, re the results had previously been obtained in mice, but due to strong differences in physiology between rodents and primates, scientists had great doubts whether this could be extrapolated to higher mammals, but nevertheless, with primates, rhizos, macaques, they managed that opened the way for possible application of these results in clinical practice for humans. So, could they make spermatids from embryonic stem cells? Yes, they did. They did not reach the final differentiation, they just stopped halfway. But during fertilization, the activation of oocyte is still required. But at least this is already an attempt of at some important study. Here the electroporation technology was used. I think that if spermatids were obtained, then there is already the correct set of chromosomes. So this data can be used in reproduction technologies. Yes, nevertheless, the efficiency is extremely low. I believe there are two paths of science at the moment. We are trying to make germ cells for embryonic precursors, and here we are limited in these actions because working with cells of human embryos is very limited in ethical terms. And the second way is when we transform a somatic cell, any fibroblast, muscle cells, epithelial cell, back into a pluripotent cell. And from it we try to get a germ cell. And here the studies are less limited.